Hello and welcome to the Mindful Millionaire podcast and YouTube channel. I'm Lisa Peterson. I'm so happy to be sharing this conversation that I had recently with Amy Minkley. Amy is a financially independent devotee, which you're going to have to listen to understand what that means. She spends part of her time in Bali. She organizes events, one of which I'm going to be speaking at in Bali in the fall. And she just has an incredible backstory about how she has created the life that she really, truly wanted to live and what you can learn from her experiences, how you might think differently about being um, in control of your money and what that means in your life and so much more. Enjoy this conversation. I can't wait to hear what you take away from it. Definitely leave comments and share what comes up for you because I think this is really fun. Enjoy. Amy, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here, Lisa, and really excited to contribute to your audience. Yeah, this is going to be a great conversation. There's so many things that you are up to that I think that my audience, my community would really benefit from learning about and hearing your story. And I'd love it to start in really general terms. If you could just tell us a little bit more about who you are, what you're doing in the world, then we will dive in deeper. How does that sound? Sounds great. Um, Yeah, my name is Amy Minkley. I am um, living in Bali. I've been living in Asia for 20 years, since 2001, I guess even longer. (laughs) Um, And I moved abroad in 2001 thinking I'll go abroad for a year or two. Um, to Japan at the time. And I'm so close to my family. So I didn't think I'd be gone very long. But it just opened my eyes to the world and to travel and how amazing, um, you know, opportunities there are abroad. And so I do come and visit my family regularly in the US. And in fact, I'm in the US now, but you know, nine months of the year, I'm living in Bali, and I absolutely love life there. Um, For 20 years, I worked in international schools in Asia. Um, So that has been an incredible opportunity, but I recently fired in 2021. Um, So I've retired from that job and I'm, you know, I'm doing some, some things on the side, some side hustles, Um, but I have more time freedom now, which is super exciting. I love that. I love that too. And because my audience may or may not know what FIRED means, can you, can you tell us more about this concept? Sure. FIRE stands for financially independence, uh, financial independence, retire early. Um, And a lot of people don't like the last part of the acronym, retire early. Most people don't. I personally don't want to sit on a beach and drink pina coladas every day. Um, But a lot of people, myself included, you know, just wanted to be, have more life options and have more time and have more choices to live life on my own terms. So to kind of break away from that Monday to Friday schedule to, you know, try something new in my life, um, fire gives people the opportunity to do that. So once, once you build a nest egg and have enough resources where you can let that grow and compound over time, um, then, you know, it gives you the option, uh, to start on, you know, really follow your passion and your purpose and try some new things in your life. So that's what I've done. I've, you know, I did love teaching and it was amazing. And also I was, I was ready to not live in, in uh, big cities anymore. And I really wanted to, I'd seen what my best life looked like. Cause I took a couple of years off sabbatical and that was amazing. And so I had seen what my best life looked like. I knew how much that cost in Bali. And I went back to work for, um, in Bangkok at an international school. And then I'm Then once I had enough money saved, I can let that compound and grow over time and I can really pursue, you know, a new chapter and try something new in my life with, you know, a couple of side hustles, but really, you know, mostly I have a lot more time freedom and I don't need to make the same salary that I made before. Um, Just I'm bringing in a little bit of money, but mostly I'm letting my investments grow. It's really clear that... Mm -hmm you were able to follow a plan that showed you that there was an ability to not be so dependent on working and making money. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you could follow things that you were really passionate about without the stress as if, you know, is it going to work? If it doesn't work, then Mm -hmm. I won't be able to pay my bills. Like it gives you freedom to choose where you're living 
what you're doing with your time and also more flexibility in the life that you're creating. When did you first find out about this concept, FIRE? When did, you, when did it enter your consciousness? Sure. Um, well, I, you know, I've always been a good saver from, from child, from young, from young age, because of a, a childhood mo- a wound I had around money from my, the time that my dad left um, and my family not having much money. Um, so I was a good saver, but I never felt safe with money. Like I just really felt like I needed to save more and, you know, I needed to have this big net worth of three or $4 million. Um, and I, you know, I would have continued to work till I was 65 because I thought that that's just what you had to do. You know, everybody works till they're 65 and I didn't really understand how much money do I actually need to retire? Um, and so, you know, I had the, those two wonderful years, sabbatical years in Bali. And then I went back to work thinking, oh, I'm not bringing any money in. I have to go back to work. And, um, I wasn't really very happy when I went back and worked again. And so in that sense of desperation, and I kind of, I went through some depression during those two years and I just searching on the internet, I found the fire movement around 2019 and the fire movement taught me a lot of financial principles. And I learned about the 4% rule, um, which is basically if you can figure out, you know, how much money, you know, you take your net worth and figure out what 4% on, of that is. And if you can live on that, you know, annually per year, your expenses, then you should have enough money to retire. Or, you know, if you want to be a little bit more conservative, you could say three and a half percent or something like that. Or you can go about it the other way. You can say, okay, if I know what my annual expenses are, just multiply that by 25 times, you know, for 4%. And so I knew how much it cost me. I'd done that life in Bali before in my sabbatical years. I knew how much it cost me to live in Bali in a year. And I can multiply that by 25 or 33 if I want to do 3% rule or something like that. And I can figure out how much net worth do I actually need. And, um, you know, according to the Trinity study, and there's been a lot of research over long periods of time, you know, regardless of the the dips in the market, you know, because your money, my money is invested in index funds that I feel like it's going to be in there for decades. So I'm um, I'm not worried and watching the, the, the weekly or daily um, you know, market returns. Um, I trust that it's okay. I trust that I've got enough of a nest egg there, even though I'm 46 years old, that it will last me. And also, you know, I want to continue to contribute. So I'm still doing some, I'm able to pursue some passions and bring in some money too. So most people don't completely never bring in another dollar either. It's not like I'm fully retired, but I, I don't need to work in the city and have the same salary. And you mentioned these wounds that that compelled you to save more. Mm-hmm. And then also the fact that because those wounds were deep, there was a natural tendency to kind of think, I just have to work, 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 and I'm not going to have the freedom that I ultimately want. Anything that perhaps comes to mind that flipped for you? I mean, was it just the money that changed? Like once you thought differently about the money and you figured out how you could live more affordably in Bali, was that all it took? Or did you also have to revisit these patterns around scarcity in your life? Like, did that change at all? Yeah, great question. I mean, truthfully, it's it's still a work in progress for me. I'm still working on it because, you know, when I've come from this, I had to, you know, I started working in a, at a young age and I had two jobs. I think we have a kind of a similar background in a way of, you know, hustling, right? Believing like how I find safety in my life is I have to hustle and I have to work hard. Um, so it is for me you know, learning those fire principles and understanding how much money do I need to save and kind of digging into the nuts and bolts of it, that did really help me having that education. Um, And I still sometimes have to work on allowing myself to spend more and breaking out of that old mentality because it is a shift. You know, when I've gone from focus on saving, 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 saving and not spending to like suddenly, you know, I don't really earn much anymore and I'm spending more than I'm earning which is not something you know that I've I'm used to um 
that's, that is a mental shift. And it really has something I'm still working on. Like, is it, you know, it's okay for me to spend. And um, I have made a lot of progress in that. And I think part of it's time as well, just seeing like, okay, you know, even if I've taken all these sabbatical years, like my net worth isn't changing, you know, um, and I'm living my optimal life. So there's nothing I would change about my life. I wouldn't live it any more luxurious than I have it already. I mean, I love, I love um, how I live in Bali and I feel like I've got everything that I need. And I know you had told me that you figured out a way, like how long you can legally live in the country without being a citizen. Mm -hmm. And so you come back every year for a certain amount of time to meet those requirements. And is that same sort of thing happening in other countries in the world? I mean, it's kind of like once you pick where you want to be, you start to figure out like, what would that look like? And how long could I stay? And what might it cost if I come back to the US or I go somewhere else? Like, mm -hmm. is all of that, I think you called this geo arbitrage, or is this, is this that concept? Tell us more. Yeah, geo arbitrage is basically choosing where to live and work, um, you know, in a way that's going to be cost effective. So, you know, people will, and it happened a lot during the pandemic, you know, people moved from the Bay Area or from California, and they chose to go and work, you know, somewhere cheaper in the US. So it doesn't have to be international, right? Um, people may work online and choose a lower cost of living place to live and work. Um, or it could be international as as well. And so I use geo arbitrage. I think, you know, all of my working career, really, I feel figured out, I love teaching and I love working with students. You know, teaching in the U.S. is very low pay, but I realized if I teach internationally, international schools, they pay extremely well. You know, they pay my housing and all of my um, flights home every year and they have great, great benefits. So I was able to save you know, really 90% of my income um, in most of those jobs. Um, so I use geo arbitrage in my working years to, you know, choose to work in Asia, but people may choose to do it, you know, in rural America or less costly places in the U.S. Um, and then also I use geo arbitrage now that I'm no longer working and earning the same amount. I'm just using geo arbitrage by choosing a lower cost of living place. Um, so living in Bali, yeah, is a, is a great example of that. But, but during my earning years, you know, I earned in Japan and I earned in Singapore, which are high cost of living areas, but the, also the pay was much higher there and my rent was covered again. So, so it can, it can look different ways depending on what stage, um, listeners are at if they're earning or, you know, post retirement. Yeah. Cause I imagine you meet people who come from all different backgrounds, people mm -hmm. in the fire movement, which I know you've been involved in for several years now. Like, what are some of those scenarios that you've seen mm -hmm. of people that you're meeting and why is it helpful to connect with other people doing this? Okay, just I, I realized as, as you were talking that I didn't answer your other question about how long I could live in a certain country. Mm -hmm. So should I go back to that? And and sure. you said a certain country, but I didn't know if you meant the U.S. or Bali or what did you mean? If you go that? to a country outside mm -hmm. of the U.S., you're going to need to figure out what are the laws, how do the visas work, mm -hmm. all of that right. sort of stuff. Because I know a lot of people have been going to Portugal, for example, yes. and they have yes. certain rules or going to, um, mm -hmm. Thailand or, you know, yeah. Bali, like there's lots of different, everyone's got a different way yes. that you've got to learn about. Right. Yeah. I mean, for, for Bali, they've got a retirement visa. If you're over 55, you can stay there. You know, once you apply for the visa, I'm not over 55. So I, I am on a tourist visa right now. Um, and I'm only allowed to stay 60 days, which is, perfect for me, honestly, because my partner's family is in Australia. So we go to see his parents. They're aging. My parents are aging in the U.S. I love to go to Singapore. I worked there for a lot of years and see friends. And there's a lot of inexpensive destinations within a two, you know, two hour flight radius. So for me, it's fun every 60 days to get out and go see some friends. And, and literally some people turn around in one day and they just, you know, leave the country and come right back. <laughs> but I, I use it as an opportunity to travel and, you know, have a change of scenery and have some, um, a different, you know, coming back to Bali is always fun when I've had a little bit of a different experience for a while. 
Um, so it can really vary country by country. I think, you know, Bali's 60 days right now, Thailand, it was, it's, it was uh, 30 days and they recently changed it to 45 days before you have to leave and come back in again. So it varies. So I'd recommend that listeners look up, you know, what is the current rules? You know, Mexico, we spent, my partner and I spent three months in Mexico last year and Mexico actually allows six months usually, but you don't always know until they stamp you as you're coming in. And, you know, sometimes it depends on the agent that you get at the airport, but usually their, their standard is six months. So there, it's a little bit more flexible in Mexico. I'm finding in Central and South America than it is. Asia is a little bit shorter um, generally on the visas as a rule. But I find Asia is a little bit cheaper than Mexico in general. So there's there's positives and negatives to every place. But um, I just recommend looking up the current rules for whatever, you know, your listeners are interested in, whichever country. And then I was thinking you might be asking about the U.S. because, you know, there are certain tax or health care implications as well. You know, if um, like my health care that I have, um, since I'm no longer working with an employer, only allows me to stay in the U.S. six months a year. So when I come to see my family, that's something that I consider. And then also, I've been abroad so long, um, you know, that's also something to consider as far as taxes. You know, I, I'm considered a um, bona fide foreign resident. Um, so I don't have to pay on any foreign earnings if I'm earning money abroad. But your first year abroad, sometimes you want to be out for for. Um, I think 330, anyway, people should look it up. Um, but I think it's 335 days you should be out of the country if you don't want to have to claim money that you may have earned outside the country just your first year. So wow. I, I hope that's, <laughs> I hope that's clear. I yeah, that's clear. I mean, it's good to know mm -hmm. that you want to fully research it and understand mm -hmm. what you're getting into before you embark on that. Um, and this question about the fire movement, like I was reading something about the fact that when people decide to do this, like get serious about, I want to retire early. I don't, I want to have a, a dependable stream of income mm -hmm. that allows me to figure out what's, you know, chapter two or chapter three. Like I want that in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't always happen right away. Like it can take five years, 10 years, 20 years to get where you want to go. If, especially if you have not been saving money and there's only so much that you can save. But what I also read is, is because you might be an anomaly in making that decision. It's very helpful to hang out with people who have also made this in, interesting and important in their lives because the conversations change. And I think you made this change several years ago and now you've been a part of this movement. And I just, I really just want to hear like, why is it important to hang out with people who think this way, who want, who share the same values as you do? Sure. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, of course I can, I learned a lot from the fire community by listening to podcasts, reading the books, you know, watching all the YouTube channels and all the information there is online. And I did that when I was in Bangkok during the pandemic and I was not happy in my job, but once the borders opened up and I quit my job and I came back to the U S I went to six fire conferences and they were, I loved it. I mean, that was six, six conferences in nine months. But there is something so special about connecting with community. And like you said, Lisa, connecting with people who are like-minded, who are inspiring, who are thinking about, you know, how can I intentionally uh, utilize my life to spend time with family and friends, have more time freedom, give back to causes I care about, start this chapter two or chapter three, try new and exciting things. You know, I didn't realize, you know, I don't know what I don't know. And just being around these amazing, inspiring people was so um, helpful. I left every weekend, every retreat feeling so uplifted and excited about life. And I will say the community, they're very heart-centered as well. And that's one thing, you know, thinking back to your question about what shifted for me um, was a lot of those conversations that I had with people in person. People were so generous to get on, um, log on to my Vanguard account with me, look at my asset allocation for free, like just help me out, look at my spreadsheet and my numbers, talk about, okay, now that, you know, you don't have an employer anymore, you don't have 
you know, healthcare covered that way. You know, I had someone meet me on Zoom who's an expert in healthcare. Just people are so wonderful and giving. And so there's there's so much knowledge, not only from at these events from the speakers, but the the audience is so knowledgeable and helpful and heart centered. So I I loved all the conversations I had, you know, around the campfire at night and you know, over meals. And, and um, that gave me a lot of confidence to speak to people who retired early and have been on this journey for, they've been retired for seven years and and for them to look at my numbers and say, no, you're okay. You know, that gave me a lot of confidence versus just kind of reading and not really having any outside perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a question for you based on what you shared. And that is at the dinner table the other day, my son who, uh, recently turned 18. He's going off to college this summer. He announces to my husband and I, I am 100% going to retire as soon as I possibly can. Okay, this is a kid who hasn't started college yet, but he's like, (laughs) I think it's a game. I don't really want to play that game, but he's going to study engineering He want, Mm -hmm. And part of the reason he chose that is he wants to make good money consistently. And he said, but I want to retire early. I want to have time freedom. And I'm curious from what you've learned, like, what would you say to someone, you know, in their late teens or twenties, who's, who's making that decision? Like, what would you say to that person? Who's like, bring it on. Yeah. I say, I mean, I really feel like fire is a superpower, you know, because we spend, you know, when you look at the statistics, you know, you've got 18 years of your youth, right? And then most people work for another 45 years. And when you look at the statistics, 85% of people don't like their jobs. And you think about 45 years in a job that you don't like, it feels like an incredible, you know, it you know makes me sad really for humanity because you think about all those those people and the human resources that could be invested in something that they really care about solving world issues and contributing in other ways so it's 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 of course you know we talk about retiring early but really it's you know giving yourself the time freedom to really pursue your passions and people want to contribute and give back so i think that's amazing for your son you know if he can save a lot of money with, you know, engineering for, for the time that he does that job and then retire early and find some way he wants to contribute in life and really follow his passions and have that time freedom. It's an incredible superpower. And I I really think that um, there are a lot of people who are excited about fire and, you know, it is a movement and people who are really wanting to, to, um, you know, engage in effective altruism. Um, so I'm excited about what what can happen um, as this, you know, as this continues to grow and people really follow their passions. Yeah. And the decisions that are made, like I was explaining some of this to my husband this morning, because he's still kind of learning about fire. And I've known about it for many years. And I'm like, well, we were doing this before it became like popular. Mm-hmm. Like that's how we were building our wealth. We have always lived more frugally, we've always made Mm -hmm. good financial decisions about um, what to spend in and what to avoid and how to make sure that we're saving a very high percentage of our income that comes in multiple different ways, like, which allows us to essentially be fired out and, and probably have been for a long time, but didn't know that's what we could call it. We just chose something different. But the idea of living, living more frugally now as you're accumulating so Mm -hmm. that you like living more frugally, making better decisions about like, do I really need this thing? Like Mm -hmm. delayed gratification is a big, is a big part of that because in order to save, you know, 50% of your income, let's say, which a lot of people figure out how to do in the finer movement, uh, your life is going to look different than your neighbor Mm -hmm. who is saving nothing, you know, and it's going to show up in a lot of different ways in our lives. The other question I'm just curious about is, you know, here's someone who's young and just starting out. My daughter is already kind of moving in that direction, but let's say you're, 
you know, in your forties or fifties and you're listening to this conversation and you haven't been able to save very much, does that mean that you can't do it? Or are you meeting people that are starting later in life and still having this make an impact in their lives? Definitely. Um, you know, I've, one of the last night we, we had a call, Lisa, with some people coming um, to Bali. And I'll say more about that later. But one of the people on the call is is a woman. She's got a blog called Started at 50 and also a podcast called Catching Up to Fire. And um, yeah, you know, Becky, she started at 50. She had a, a zero net worth at 50. And, you know, her and her husband learned a lot. And, you know, they had some debt too. And really, they started listening to Dave Ramsey, you know, first got themselves out of debt, then built up their emergency fund, and then really, you know, ratcheted up their savings rate and really thought, you know, because they had been spenders, they had been high earners, but they had also been high spenders in the past and kind of looked at their life and thought, you know, we really don't need all these things, bigger car, bigger house, you know, let's, let's um, scale back a little bit, because really what we want is time you know, time freedom and choices in life. And they were able to um, retire a few years early, not, you know, really early, um, but they 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 just ratcheted up their savings, right? And they gave themselves um, more, more, more options and more choices by doing that. Yeah. So I would say it's never too late. And so don't, you know, if a listener is like beating themselves up, like I didn't start early enough, you know, we didn't, we weren't taught this in school. And um, so, you know, I wouldn't ever focus on the past, just focus on, you know, how much can I save? And of course, if something brings your brings you value, you know, spend on it lavishly, um, but really being intentional in those choices and thinking about, I don't necessarily need to keep up with the Joneses, you know, what can I do to reduce things that don't really bring me value and don't matter to me that much? Yeah, yeah, spend lavishly on the things that are most important to you. And then find ways to go without and be okay with, with it. The other thing that comes up that people mention, and even in one of the calls I ran this morning, I was talking about this. And uh, one of my clients had said, I was on the track to be able to retire by 35, but then we had children mm -hmm. and children changed everything because yes. children can be really expensive. And a hundred percent, you know, they, they add a lot of costs. And at the same time, there are a lot of people with children who are in the fire movement who figure it out. But I feel like I could write a book just on that one topic alone, because mm -hmm. when we get in that lifestyle of like, well, this is what all the kids do. This is just mm -hmm. expected. Mm -hmm. It typically has a lot of dollar signs associated with it and being able to disconnect from that, you know, like, no, this isn't what we do. <laughs> you know, like, there isn't any money for the $2,000 ski program every year, you know, mm -hmm. sorry, kids, if there's a locals mm -hmm. program, that's a couple hundred bucks, mm -hmm. you can do that, but we're not going to do this. And making those choices along the way is very difficult, but it pays mm -hmm. off. And so it's, it's like literally picking every little thing up in your life and saying, mm -hmm. is this mm -hmm. that high of a value, you know, mm -hmm. that, that we need to do this versus keeping that money now. And I'll give you an example, Amy, of why, mm -hmm. like what I think makes such a difference. When my daughter was growing up, we could have easily spent a couple thousand dollars every year getting her skis. We grew up, she grew up in a ski community, skis and the ski program. And when I did all the math, it was a couple thousand dollars to do that. And we were like, we don't, we're not going to invest in that. That's not a good thing for us. You're not going to be a ski racer. I don't think you're really all that into skiing. You know, that might've been different. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to do something like dance that was a lot less expensive. And Recently, my daughter um, is, you know, 25 and we were able, because of all that money that was saved to help her buy her first home. Yes. And wow. it, it, people don't realize like $2,000 mm -hmm. for 10 years over many, mm -hmm. many years of compounding, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. help someone buy a house with that money. Like we just don't realize how yes. those small amounts add up to mm -hmm. big numbers over a 20 or 30 year period. And, 
I think learning about how that works is what you're referencing mm -hmm. when you talk about spreadsheets and things like that. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to um, mention that, but there was also something that you said. Um, Can I just say one yeah, thing adding please. on to that is paying attention to your big expenses. You know, the big three, you know, the housing, the car, transportation and food is huge. You know, because, you know, people talk about the latte factor and, you know, if, if lattes really bring you joy, you know, buy them, of course. But if you can think about your big three expenses and like those kind of high item, you know, high dollar item things like you talked about, like the ski skis and the ski camps and all of that, you know, can really make a difference. You know, like a, a new car versus a nice used car can make a big difference, right? Because some yeah. pe sometimes people realize they, they think they buy a new car, but they don't realize like that you may be adding five years onto your working life if that money had been invested, you know, and compounded over time. So when you... You know, and there's a great book called Your Money and Your Life and talking about life energy. And when you actually figure out how much your time is worth and think about, you know, how many years do I have to actually work to buy that thing? Yeah. So, yeah. Totally. And this is, um, it's funny because back in the 90s, I mean, Vicki, that book was like life changing for me. And I was so excited. Uh, Grant is very close to Vicky and mm -hmm. he got her a copy of The Mindful Millionaire and she read it before it came out. And that was just like highlight, you know, bucket list, not even possible mm -hmm. that this is going to happen and yet it's happening. And so I am eternally grateful to that work and Joe and Vicky and what they, what they started in, in my mind. And, and that is often referred to as one of the foundational books that helped inspire so many people over time. But the, that, the point that we want to make sure people hear in, in referencing to the folks that you've crossed paths with, that it's never too late to start. Mm -hmm. It can make a difference. It can give you greater freedom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times people start businesses and they may start those businesses without being well-resourced. And it's not something I recommend. I would prefer that you have already fired out and then you're starting a business, but that might not be possible. But the deal mm -hmm. is, is when we start businesses, it can be um, slow going. It can take time to create the kind of income stream that we're able to save this kind of money. And sometimes people might even go back to work for a short period of time with a plan because it's going to help them achieve their goals. And I'm saying this for folks who really need to hear it, that that's okay. You're not failing by going back to work because you see that you'll be able to, you know, save a lot of money for five years to give you more freedom later in life, for example, or maybe even longer than that. But each of us are on our journey. And I think sometimes it's hard to make some of these choices, but I, I want folks who are, who are listening to this conversation see the possibility. And so now I wanna talk about what you're up to, like what all of this has led you to be able to be passionate about. Um, and maybe you can share, like you must've gotten an idea along the way going to those conferences that there was something that you could potentially put together. Yes. Um, well, I had the idea in Bangkok during those two years where I was during the pandemic working a lot. I went back into old patterns of overworking and saving, saving, saving to feel safe and found the fire movement and heard about these events in the U.S. But I was, you know, it's pandemic time. So I was in Thailand in my job and I wasn't able to travel. Um, but that gave I had the idea back then. I just thought, you know, there's something special about community and meeting people. And I live in Asia. I've lived there a long time and I want to create community on this side of the world and um, so then once I quit my job and went back to the U.S. and spent some time with my parents um, and attended all these conferences then I was even more excited because I saw the power of community firsthand and I felt so inspired by how people contributed to me and I want to I want to contribute back and you know build continue to build this fire community and show people the possibility that can you know they can have in their lives um, so I'm creating a fire event in Bali and I'm super excited. It's the first one in Asia Pacific on that side of the world, multi-day retreat, and it sold out quite quick. So um, the demand is there. So I'm very excited. I'm going to open a few more seats in mid-April. Um, I have acquired a few more rooms and I'm getting on podcast in Australia and in the region as well to kind of 
spread the word over there. Um, but I'm very excited. Yeah, we've got great speakers coming in. Would you like to share about that? Yeah. yeah. Well, part of what brought us together was the book. And then you reached out and and I'm coming to Bali for the first time to speak at this wonderful event with friends and all these folks that I can't wait to meet and, and be inspired by. But yeah, it's it's super exciting because you inspired me to see the possibility in so many ways. And Bali, oh my gosh, the more I learn from you, the more I it's like a whole world has opened up as we started to talk. And I'm so like grateful, like for the rest of my life, I know I'm going to be grateful to you, Amy, for this opportunity to learn more about Bali and, and be shepherded into this experience. But yeah, but you're not going to start like, this is just the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. I'm planning an event in 2024 and I'll, I'll plan to do one at once a year. Um, yeah, it is. It is super exciting. I mean, I feel like the event, you know, there's going to be a lot of talk around, you know, finances and optimizing and how to, you know, to create, you know, use finances to create more time freedom and life choices. And really, it's all it's all about, you know, life and, and your time and your energy and, and how to optimize things in that area. Um, but it's, you know, the speakers are going to be great. The, the community of participants who are there are going to be great. There's a lot of actually in the audience, podcasters and knowledgeable people, um, you know, people have worked on Wall Street, quite knowledgeable audience in general, and, and some beginners too. So no matter where people are on their financial journey, if they're just starting out and learning, or they're already, you know, they've reached financial independence, we'll have people all along the journey coming, sharing, helping each other out, we're going to have adventures around Bali, we're going to be seeing amazing sights, you know, having water temple blessings, going to cultural dances, hanging out. And it's going to be an intimate group of about with all the speakers, it'll be about 45 people over five days. And then some people are going to stick around and, you know, if, if people want to go to the beach together afterwards, and we're going to hang out a little bit smaller group if you don't have to rush back to work. Um, so, you know, if people are interested in from your community and coming, I would recommend you know, if you can come and stay for a longer, because it is, it is a little bit of a journey to get over there and there's some jet lag and all of that. So you want to come for more than the five days. Ideally, you, you come and stay, you know, a week or two weeks or, you know, a month if you can. So yeah, it all on. totally. And it's, it's more affordable. It was funny because as I started to learn about it, because of the costs there compared to the costs here, I was noticing that, you know, a week in Sedona for a retreat I put together is more expensive than oftentimes like a week in Bali. And I was just blown away. Now I understand why people are hosting events there because people, you can make it affordable. The other thing that you did, Amy, last night that I was just so blown away by as you walked us all through, like, here's how you can use miles. And not only that, like, here's how you can get the miles, you know, through a brand new credit card to get the miles that you need to get the ticket to Bali. And then here's how you can use points at different hotels if you decided to extend your stay. And I loved how you're incorporating these fire movement concepts into the organization of it so that it doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg, that this can be an affordable trip and that uh, you can do it. Like you are showing everyone how you can do this. It's okay. There's lots of options. I just love that part of it. Yeah. I mean, I love welcoming people to Bali and I love helping people with their travels. So, you know, if any of your listeners are interested in coming and they want to know, you know, they could, they, they're welcome to go to my contact page on my website and um, so it's five freedom retreats with an S.com and book a call with me. And, you know, I can walk them through using credit cards to fly for free. Um, you know, if they've got Hyatt points, you know, we're planning on after the retreat going down to the Grand Hyatt Bali, which is right on the beach. It's beautiful and it's 5,000 points a night. I can't believe it. I'm like, <laughs> how can I make it 5,000 points a night? It's gorgeous. So, um, you know, we, I really do want to make it affordable for people, you know, pre and post retreat. 
Um, so, you know, there are lots of, yeah, great money saving tips and Bali is very affordable. I live a super luxurious life there and I couldn't want for anything more. And my life is not very expensive there. Wow. This has been super enlightening. I'm so excited that we were able to have this conversation. We covered so many things and I love that we'll give the, we'll give the link in case you didn't catch that in the show notes. Uh, so you can check out the retreat this year, maybe to, to not going to be easy to get those tickets, but you never know next year. And also just to learn more about the fire movement, about how people can create so many beautiful things in their lives that maybe they didn't even realize were possible. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been fun to talk. I've, I've enjoyed it. Thank you. I, pre- Thank I appreciate everything that you're creating in the world. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to have you as a speaker is just your, your focus on money mindset and abundance and, you know, overcoming scarcity mindset. And I think it's such a valuable lesson and message to share. So thank you for your contribution in the world. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel. That way you'll get all the latest updates of meditations, tapping videos, Uh, different coaching calls that I share on the YouTube channel, and also be sure to take my money and chakra quiz. This shows you where you might be out of balance as it pertains to money and exactly what you can do for your next steps.